I would like to thank the organizing committee for this great conference. It's an honor to be here. So today I'm going to talk about cerebral palsy mimickers. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, the cerebral palsy, the definition, classification, red flags, and some of the metabolic and genetic diseases that mimic, that mimic cerebral palsy. So as Dr. Qutsiya said a while ago, uh, cerebral palsy is a heterogeneous group of conditions involving permanent motor dysfunction that affects muscle tone, posture, and movement. And it's caused by an abnormality to a developing brain. Uh, we have to always remember that cerebral palsy is a neurological syndrome. It's not, a, it's not like an etiological entity. If we look at, the, in 2019, the International Cerebral Palsy Consortium, they released a consensus saying that the cerebral palsy is a phenotype, it's not an etiology. So it's neither specific, not pathological, or an etiological entity. If you look at the prevalence, it happens in two per uh, thousand large births. In Saudi Arabia, we have to double that. It's, uh, for their thousand life births. And the prevalence is far more common in premature, and also it increases with decreasing the gestational age and the birth weight. Causes, usually 80% uh, are antenatal, 10% are perinatal, and another 10% is, uh, are postnatal. Prematurity is one of the most common causes. It's associated with spastic diplegia, where usually the lower limbs are affected uh, more than the upper limbs and it's usually caused by periventricular leukomalacia, where the white matter along the ventricle is being affected. Perinatal asphyxia also is a big cause. It's usually associated with uh, spastic quadriplegia, mainly when the watershed areas are affected. But also it can cause uh, dyskinetic CP when the basal ganglia injury happens or the deep gray white matter. Maternal and fetal uh, infection also may uh, play a role in the pathogenesis of cerebral palsy. Perinatal stroke also is a common cause, usually associated with hemiplegic CPs. These babies usually presented at the age of six months with hand preference and uh, motor delay. Uh, we can classify cerebral palsy as being spastic, dyskinetic, or ataxic. And then we follow the topographic uh, distribution. It could be spastic hemiplegia, spastic diplegia, where lower limbs are affected more than the upper limbs, or spastic quadriplegia. And uh, it could be a dyskinetic, i.e. mainly atetoid or dyskinetic, or dystonic, sorry, or it could be ataxic. It's not, cerebral palsy, it's not always what it seems. Um, a lot of mimickers, mainly metabolic and genetic disorders, start very early. Usually they are non-progressive, they could be non-progressive, or it could be very slowly progressive. Also remember, in this part of the world, we lack appropriate uh, newborn screening program and uh, genetic investigation is not widely available. We need to diagnose these patients early because this will uh, have an impact on the therapy. It will also tell us, or we can counsel the parents about the prognosis, and it's very important for genetic counseling. As Dr. Akutsiya said in the previous uh, lecture, it's not always what it seems. There is a lot of uh, features that raise the possibility that we are dealing with something else. It's not a cerebral palsy. When there is an absence of known risk factor, when there is a family history of neurological condition, remember in this part of the world, consanguinity rate is reaching more than 60%. So if you have more than one member in the family affected, think about another uh, cause. If we have a loss of previously acquired miles, uh, stones, if there is a neuroregression, if there is a rapid deterioration of neurological signs, if there is an intense extra pyramidal uh, symptom like ataxia or dystonia, and mainly if these dystonia or ataxia are getting worse with the uh, periods of catabolism, when there is a fever or there is fasting. If there is muscle atrophy or sensory loss, think about more like neuromuscular condition. First step usually in, after taking history and examination, we need to do a perform, we need to perform an MRI for a patient who is presenting with cerebral palsy. Uh, remember that new imaging is not a diagnostic criteria, but it's very important to uh, for us to understand the pathogenesis for the underlying brain disorder. It's usually abnormal in more than 80% of the cases. So when we have a patient who's presenting with cerebral palsy, we start to take a history and examination. Is this sub suggestive cerebral palsy? Confirm that the, in the history, there is no signs of progression. There is no signs of degenerative disorder. Try to classify your CP. What, what kind of CP are we dealing with, and screen for associated condition from up down. And then the big question comes, does the patient have a previous neuroimaging? 
if he neuro imaging was done and it's suggested for the cause there is no need for their further diagnostic testing if there is no mri of course you need to obtain an mri so if the mri is abnormal the next question if there is any evidence of cerebral infarction if yes you have to consider thrombophilia worker especially in this uh, part of the world if there is no evidence of cerebral infarction and your MRI and clinical history and clinical exam establishes the trick diagnosis, of course, there is no need for further testing. If not, or if the MRI is normal, you need to start by metabolic screen, serum amino acid, urine organic acid, ammonia, lactate, blood gas, and then consider genetic testing, and also consider sort in check, uh, infection if uh, prenatal history is suggested. These are some of the common uh, features we see in patients who is having the cerebral palsy. So here, so here we can see if there, if there is an area of uh, um, body microgyria in uh, the other picture. This is the typically the, when the white matter is being affected. This is a periventricular leukomalacia. So this is an ex premature patient who is presenting with spastic cerebral palsy. And the, this one, so we have mainly the deep gray matter affected, mainly in the thalamus and in the basal ganglia. And this is patients typically present with this kind of cerebral palsy, which usually happens in patients who is having perinatal asphyxia because of cord prolapse or if they are having placenta abruptio. This is an example of a patient premature who is having cerebellar ataxia and presenting with ataxic cerebral palsy. Sometimes things are even more complicated. Look at this picture, the first two here. This is a patient who is who is premature at age of seven months. We did an MRI, and it's an as you can see, the MRI is, is uh, basically it looks normal. But if we repeat MRI several years later, you can see that reticular um, periventricular leukomalacia with, with ex vacuo dilatation of the ventricle and reduction of the white matter. Several years ago, Dr. Clara uh, Karen Peek, she published a paper, it was like a landmark. She described 54 uh, important error of metabolism that uh, mimic cerebral palsy. Only three years later, another paper came, which is describing three times uh, higher the condition. It was 150 important error of metabolism that mimic cerebral palsy. And now in the era of uh, next generation sequencing, we can see a lot of cohorts coming, telling us that around one third of the patients who are with the cerebral palsy actually have an underlying genetic cause. So in the next half of the lecture, I'm going to share with you some of the cases that I saw in the last several years. First case is a five-year-old boy. He's a full-term, normal spontaneous vertex delivery. He stayed in the NICU for 10 days. He was labeled for, as a cerebral palsy. He was referred to my clinic for choreoid movement. And when I examined him, he was having these uh, even autistic features. Of course, after history and examination, we obtained an MRI, and his MRI was completely normal. Uh, sorry, like this was an MRI which was done in his previous hospital. So when we repeated an MRI, and of course, at a standard, we do an MRS for all of our patients, and we can see there is something missing here. So there was no creatinine peak. So when we sent the creatinine panel, the urine guanido acetate was extremely high, and this patient was diagnosed to have a mutation in the GAMP gene. So he was diagnosed with cerebral creatine deficiency syndrome, which is a treatable condition. This patient was started on creatine monohydrate, and after that, he showed great improvement. His motor uh, uh, functions improved, his cystic features improved, and his uh, abnormal movement disappeared. Another case is a four-year-old boy. He was labeled as cerebral palsy. He was an ex-premature 34-weeker. He stayed in the NICU for two weeks. He was referred to my clinic with new onset seizures. When I examined him, he was having some mild appendicular spasticity and axial hypotonia. He was having this eczema and abnormal hair distribution. Interestingly, his MRI was also normal. And when we sent for the initial investigation, we include, we include uh, Biotinidase in all uh, our patients because a lot of them, if they are having a partial biotinidase deficiency, they will skip the neonatal uh, screening program. And his biotinidase level was 2.3 only, the normal is 4 to 5. And this patient was found to have a mutation in the BTD gene, which is a, uh, and after we start biotin, the symptoms improved. 
another case is the two and a half year old boy. His gestational age was uh, 28 weeks, cesarean section, and I see for six weeks. He was referred to me mainly because of irritability. And when I examined him, he was having spasticity and microcephaly. And this is his initial MRI. If you look at the MRI, see he's having basically white matter changes, but there is no reduction in the white matter. So this is likely he's having a leukodystrophy rather than uh, periventricular leukomanation. And when we did a CT for him, he was having this calcification. So he was found to have a mutation in the ranch 2B gene, which is an extremely common cause of uh, a cardiogeter in uh, Saudi Arabia. And now we know that all these interferonopathies are uh, kind of detectable. Another case is a four-year-old boy, supported to full care, normal spontaneous vertex delivery. Parents told us that he was having an infection at age of one month. He was admitted to the hospital for a couple of months, and he was uh, diagnosed to have spastic cerebral palsy, and he was referred to my clinic for uh, dystonia. And we took history. His dystonia was progressive, and there was diurnal variation, and it mainly gets worse when he's having an infection. We had obtained an MRI for him, and he was having some kind of necrosis in the basal ganglia, mainly in the vitamina, and also in the um, caudate. When we look back, back at his MRI at age of one month, he was having high signal in the basal ganglia, in the thalamus, and uh, subcortically. But interestingly, the caudate head was uh, spared. And also, he was having diffusion restriction in the perilandic area which is a typical distribution for biotin thiamine responsive basal ganglion disease. So this patient was started on biotin and thiamine, and the genetic testing showed homozygous truncated mutation, uh, which uh, is consistent with complete loss of function in SLC19A3, uh, which confirmed the diagnosis of biotin and thiamine responsive basal, ga basal ganglion disease. After it started biotin and thiamine, there was a great improvement. And even we reported that, that uh, uh, these early atypical new imaging findings are the same responsible for ganglia disease. Another patient, this is Saleh, he was uh, referred to my clinic. So this is Saleh. He was referred to my clinic because of uh, uh, this hematopathic posture. He was with irritability from general pediatric. Sorry, I need to. And how can we put the sound here? So this is Saleh, he was referred to my clinic because he was labeled as cerebral palsy. He's an ex-premature baby. And he was referred to my clinic because this this clinic posturing and he was having uh, extreme irritability. When we took uh, history from him, we found that he was having progressive microcephaly. And when we did an MRI, look at this, he's having like uh, open orbicular and he's having temporal lobe uh, atrophy. There is high signal in the basal ganglia, even subcortical uh, white matter changes. And in the urine uh, uh, organic acid testing, he was finding to have butyric acid urea type 1. He was diagnosed at the age of three years or four years old. And this is after we started him in um, lysine, in, uh, uh, special formula, lysine restricted diet. See, like the difference between the first video and second video. Still, he's globally delayed, but this guy, he unfortunately he escaped the um, newborn screening. Another case, this was, I, I just saw him last year, three-year-old uh, boy. He was uh, diagnosed to have spastic diplegia. He was having progressive lower limb spasticity. When we took uh, uh, history from the family, there is another two kids who is affected. His MRI brain was normal. MRI spine was normal. We thought that we are initially dealing with hereditary spastic paraplegia. But when we did uh, urine uh, serum amino acid, his RG gene was extremely high, and he was have, uh, found to have uh, ARG1 gene mutation, which is diagnostic of arginase deficiency. And now there's a novel treatment for that. Again, this is a treatable condition. So the phenotype, usually in this part of the world, is typical as hereditary spastic paraplegia. Uh, neurotransmitter disorder is a group of inherited disorder that affects the synthesis, breakdown, and transport of the biogenic amines. 
mainly dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, and serotonin. And usually, they are a typical example of the cerebral palsy mimickers. This is a patient, a small girl figure. She was presented to my clinic because of these abnormal movements. So she was having frequent oculogyric crisis. She was having uh, axial uh, hypotonia. And she was tried on multiple antiepileptic medication. So this patient was found to have severe terrain reductase deficiency. Interestingly, two of her cousins come to my clinic next week. One of them has happened specifically of the lower limb. Look at the other girl. Sorry. She was having typically like, it looks like a phenotype of spastic uh, diplegia with lower limb specificity. And these patients, when we started them on, um, on treatment, uh, they improved. So uh, there was a homozygous uh, mutation in the SPR gene, which is consistent with uh, bacterial reductase deficiency. Currently, in my clinic, uh, I have like more than 15 patients who's having severe the case deficiency. So it's not it's a quite common condition. Usually, uh, uh, in the CSF neurotransmitter, there is decreased levels of hom homovalinic acid and 5 hydroxyindole acetic acid with increased level of total biobitrin, dihydrobiobitrin, and serotonin. For treatment, of course, we give you need to give like LDOBA and 5 hydroxy tryptophan to correct the serotonin deficiency. I'm going to skip this part because Dr. Babeker is going to talk about the AAD deficiency because uh, it's one of the also common condition as always misdiagnosed as having uh, cerebral palsy. Another case, this is a girl, seven years old. He, she was having spastic lower limb. And when we examined him, actually it was not spasticity, it was dystonia in the lower limb with inward deviation of both uh, lower limb. And this is one several, this is several months after trying uh, starting this patient on Eldoba, and this patient was diagnosed to having the Sigawa disease. So the GCH1 DOBA responsive dystonia, usually the main age of presentation is five to 10 years with the um, well, uh, predominance in females. Classically, they have postural dystonia in lower extremities, where usually there is an onward uh, rotation of the feet. They uh, have usually pyramidal signs with increased retinal the reflexes. This is another girl, also is having spastic lower limb. And when we examine him, uh, her, she, there was diurnal variation, which was actually dystonia, not a spasticity. And this is after starting treatment. Sorry, it's not working. So after starting treatment, these symptoms completely disappeared after two weeks. So uh, Sigawa disease, usually diagnosis is made by combination of clinical features, biochemical and genetic testing, supported for trial of therapy, usually start LDOBA to reach five milligram per kilogram daily. This is a boy I saw maybe three, four months ago. He was, uh, this is in one of the rehab uh, centers in Saudi Arabia. He was uh, diagnosed to have a spastic uh, cerebral palsy, mainly dyskinetic type. He was having these movement disorders. And interestingly, the mother mentioned that there is a clear diurnal variation. These symptoms increase mainly after uh, when the baby attempts to sleep. His MRI was normal. And when we did whole exome sequencing, he was having an ADC Y5 related dyskinesia. We tried multiple medication, and now he went to perform a deep tundra, deep uh, brain stimulation. My last case is an 18-month-old boy with a positive family history of spastic cerebral palsy. He presented with spastic hemiplegia, and this is also one of the common uh, common conditions in Saudi Arabia, which is a collagen vascular disease. They call for a gene mutation. So once you're having a patient who's presenting with uh, spastic hemiplegia because of the antenatal or perinatal stroke, and there is no clear risk factor, think about that. For the take-home messages, Usually take a careful history, clinical examination, and neuroimaging. Next generation sequencing usually helps us a lot, mainly in genetic and metabolic clinicals of cerebral palsy. A correct diagnosis has a huge implication in the prognosis, specific treatment, and genetic counseling. Thank you.